The next subject to cover in contract law is the offer itself, because all contracts will need to have an offer, and it begins with analyzing the offer. The person who makes the offer is the promisor. And we can think of the offer as a type of promise. There's concepts of uh, mutual performances, but the usual way that contracts operate is an exchange of promises, and so we need to understand what is a promise. And the restatement section two identifies the promise as a manifestation to act or refrain from acting in a certain way. And not just that promise is made, but it's made in a way that would justify the offeree, the person hearing that, in believing that a commitment was made. So things that are obviously a joke or sarcastic, and there are some context which you might think that's not really a promise that would be binding. And then just some terminology, the person manifesting the assent, uh, manifesting the offer rather, the person who makes the offer is known as the promisor, O-R, and the person who hears and receives and may accept the offer is the promisee, E-E. Now, what are they assenting to? They're assenting to a bargain. And we get back to the concept of bargain in the concept of consideration, but we need to find that there is a bargain. A bargain is an agreement to make an exchange, to exchange promises, a promise for a promise, or a promise for performance, or mutual performances. Usually, we're going to be looking at mutual promises. I promise to sell you my car on Thursday if you promise to pay me $10,000 when I deliver the vehicle, an exchange of mutual promises that was actually sought for. Now one thing that can confuse students is that bargain does not require bargaining. It does not mean that we had a back and forth or protracted negotiations or discussions. It's enough that I make an offer which contemplates an exchange for value and you accept that offer. We don't need bargaining to have a bargain. We simply need exchange for value. And that begins with the offer. The offer will contain all of the terms. This is another point that confuses students. The offer contains all the terms, including what the offeree will do upon acceptance. It provides all the terms of the offer, and so we need to have a manifestation by the offeror of a willingness to enter into a bargain. And that bargain needs to be uh, detailed enough that a court could enforce it on its terms. We'll talk about section 33 after we talk about section 24, but really the two components, the two things that an offer requires are the manifestation of intent to be bound by reasonably certain terms. This manifestation of the offer is an outward manifestation. A manifestation means a clear outward sign that a particular feeling exists. It is not private and kept internal motivations. It is not subjective views. If you think you're joking and the other person does not, as we see in Lucy B. Zemmer, you have made an outward manifestation that appears to be serious. And so courts will look to what the actual outward manifestation, meaning the observable, verifiable phenomenon, what actually occurred. And you can picture this as if there is a third party observer in the room. And um, oh, only some of my emojis came out here. But uh, to, to the, what I mean by here is we have sort of our various components. Over here we had a, uh, the smiley face going, hmm. And so that's our offeree on the side of this equation. So we have the offeror who is making a manifestation. And usually that's verbal or written. There can be manifestations by actions, which is a little trickier. But we see that some type of words or thoughts have actually come into being. And we have this concept of a third party observer. What I've depicted here is the I here, the idea of there being sort of what, a, what is the observable phenomenon that has occurred, that has occurred to over here with our, our offeree, the offeree who has then received this manifestation. Our first case that dealt with this was Embry. And the issue in Embry was whether a man named McKittrick, who was in charge of running this operation, made a promise. Made a promise to employ Embry for another year. Embry was uh, on a term of years contract, so he had a, a, a year at a time, and his job was to pick out materials for salesmen. It was time for him to renew his contract, and he kept on asking McKittrick, are you going to renew my contract or not? McKittrick finally said, go ahead, you're all right. Get your men out and do not let that worry you. Now, that neutral observer, that eye kind of floating in the sky, that is the observer of this statement in this case. So we're thinking, what would a, what would a neutral party who's sort of floating up there think of these words? What would a reasonable person 
uh, see, and they would see Embry's situation, they would see McKittrick, they would see the words uh, spoken or written, and then evaluate whether or not that reasonably constitutes a promise. We have this reasonable person concept here. And here the court found that this was in fact a promise. This was a manifestation of an intention to be bound by these particular terms. This is because a reasonable person who is in the position of that observer, who then hears those words, would understand this to mean an offer to remain employed for an additional year. The question is whether that manifestation <coughs> made objectively and viewed through the lens, the eye of a reasonable person constitutes a promise. And the court found here the words, go ahead, you're all right, get your men out and do not let that worry you, would make a reasonable person in uh, Embry's position believe that an offer, a promise to continue employment would have been made. We get into the idea of subjective intentions with our next case of Lucy V. Zemmer. The issue here is when <clears throat> W O uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Lucy, uh, Mr. Zemmer made an offer to Lucy to sell a personal property called the for a particular property, the Ferguson Farm, this famous Ferguson Farm, and they didn't, they discussed this terms, uh, the price and other terms for well over an hour. They wrote it out on a restaurant bill, which is shown on the slide behind me, and in fact they rewrote it because. Uh, Lucy demanded that Mrs. Zemmer also sign it, and so they actually wrote it and then rewrote it, and then both Mr. and Mrs. Zemmer signed it. Now, the thing is that Zemmer claimed he was just bluffing. He said they were two doggone fools, about as high as a Georgia pine. And under this circumstance, you know, he doesn't think he should be bound to sell the Ferguson farm. But the court found otherwise. They looked here at the testimony of an eyewitness. They looked at a waitress who was actually present at the time. And now the waitress is sort of a stand-in for that concept of the reasonable person who is that observer. She's neutral. She's not biased. She doesn't have, let's say, a dog in this fight. She doesn't care whether the farm is sold or not. She's not going to be a recipient, a beneficiary of that. And so she plays, in this case, the very interesting role of being that neutral observer, that eye in the sky, who then can opine as to whether or not a reasonable person would believe that Zemmer made an offer to Lucy. And her testimony is very compelling in this case because having witnessed the length of time that they negotiated, having witnessed the signature, having known the parties, seeing that they were not dead drunk, she is able to say that a reasonable person in Lucy's position would have reasonably understood that an offer was made to him because of the objective manifestation. The fact that uh, Zemmer on the side may or may not have whispered to his wife, don't worry, I'm just bluffing, is of no moment here because he made those outward manifestations. The objective test does have its limit limitations. Sometimes there is no clear one objective reality that we can so to speak, hang our hats on. In the case of Raffles v. Wickelhouse, the parties specified that some cotton would sail on a ship called Peerless from Bombay to London. And it turned out that ironically, with a name like Peerless, there were in fact two ships with that same name, two different ships, and they were sailing on two different dates. And so a third party who was not aware which boat they were talking about would actually not be able to specify whether peerless meant the peerless sailing in December or the peerless sailing at a later time. Now, how will a court deal with the situation when there is no objective meaning, when there is nothing that is objectively true? If a court has no basis for choosing between a party's different subjective meanings, there is probably not a contract. There is probably not sufficiently definite terms for the parties to be bound. Courts can sometimes fill in the gaps and they can uh, uh, it's, they are gap filler provisions under statute, especially under the UCC, but courts are hesitant to make a bargain where no contract really exists. And so if we do not have an objective reality that we could reasonably say we meant ship A or ship B, there may not be a contract at all. And this ties into our next concept of whether an offer is sufficiently definite to constitute a promise that courts can enforce. This turns us then to section 33 in the restatement, which says that even though a manifestation of intention is intended to be understood as an offer, it cannot be accepted so as to form a contract unless the terms are reasonably certain. Now again, we have that reasonableness concept, so we must be dealing with, grappling with facts 
to address what is reasonable in this circumstance. And so we're going to have to see a couple different cases to understand how that plays out. The first case that we had about this was called Quake Construction versus American Airlines. And here we had a particular type of document that's common in a commercial contracting process called a letter of intent. The parties had signed a letter of intent. It had many terms, but it wasn't clear whether or not they intended to be bound to actually do the construction work based on the letter of intent. Furthermore, this letter of intent had a cancellation clause a concept that we'll come back to, and whether or not a cancellation clause actually would make any promises illusory since one party does not truly have to perform. The Quake Court presented the rule. The fact that the parties contemplate a formal agreement will eventually be executed does not necessarily render all prior agreements as mere negotiations. However, parties may specify that negotiations are not binding until a former agreement is in fact executed. So the fact that there is preliminary negotiations, the fact that they are talking about we're going to sign a deal in three weeks does not actually itself make those preliminary negotiations not a contract. We have to look at other features of it. Under this rule, the Quake Court here found the cancellation clause, though, made the party's intent ambiguous. And this at least made it impossible for the judge to rule that this formed a contract because that cancellation clause showed that there was a real uncertainty if the parties were willing to be bound, and the fact it was called a letter of intent and not a final contract also indicated that there were still some terms missing and the parties needed more time to spell those out. So in the case of Quake Construction, we do have a situation of mere preliminary negotiations. The letter of intent here is going to be found non-binding in large part because it has a cancellation clause. The court, though, goes through a number of features, factors, which can help us to determine whether or not preliminary negotiations, especially when written down, will become binding. When a letter of intent or others, many other types of documents that are styled differently, that all come to the same issue, whether or not the parties have actually intended to be bound by what they have written, or they don't intend to be bound until later. And so they ask whether that agreement would usually be in writing, whether the writing that they have has few details or many details, whether the agreement is for a small amount of money or for a large amount of money, whether the negotiations indicated a formal written document would be produced in the future, when the negotiating process was abandoned, why the negotiating process was abandoned, the extent to which assurances of a new contract, a written formal contract would be given, and sort of an equitable concept whether the parties relied. There are even more factors that could be considered, but this gives you an idea about how fact-specific a reasonableness inquiry is. And again, the fundamental question is whether the parties intended to be bound. We look at their outward objective manifestations, we see the letter of intent, we see the conduct of the parties, and we determine did the parties intend to be bound by it. Something similar, just slightly different, in the case of Sun Printing, and the court here found what they called an agreement to agree and did not find an enforceable contract in Sun Printing. There was a contract that had an initial performance period, and then afterwards the price was not set. Now, the dissent did bring up that the price could be calculated based on a formula or at least had a minimum, creating a type of option. But in this case, the majority said that because there was no price term for the period after the preliminary period, there was no contract for that period. And so one thing we take away from this is price is usually an essential term. If we don't have a price term and we just have this preliminary period, we are generally looking at simply an agreement to agree because the parties have not uh, agreed on that most fundamental concept of price and courts will be very hesitant to impose a price term. Now this is not true under the UCC where a price term is not strictly required. You only need a quantity term under the UCC, but still it will be hard for courts to find that there was a contract if they don't know how to enforce the bargain. And here, since there was no stated price term, at least according to the majority, and again, from if you remember my lecture for this, I happen to agree more with the dissent because I think that this was more re readily calculable than the majority recognized. Uh, I think we do see that Cardozo here, as the majority, the, in the majority, is at least coming across with the policy uh, rationale that 
that parties should be able to make their own choices and that we're not going to impose a contract where none exists. And so he's very hesitant to determine what that price term should be where the parties themselves have not agreed to it. And so we have here this agreement to agree because of a unresolved price term, again, reminding us that the price term is almost always required in contracts under common law for them to be sufficiently definite. We had a much more complicated fact pattern in Academy Cheever Publishers versus Cheever. And this is the case where Mrs. Cheever agreed to produce stories for an anthology for her late husband, Mr. Cheever, which was going to be published by Academy Chicago Publishers. But there was a number of terms that were missing here. It was not missing a price term. And so it actually then shows that simply having a price term is not enough to make a contract. The courts will look at the entire contract. But here we were missing many, many key criteria that you would expect to find in an enforceable contract. So here they did not agree on the length of the book. They did not agree on how to select the stories that would go into it. They did not agree when the manuscript was due or how the book would be published or the period of availability. The court will not, under these terms, at least the Supreme Court, will not make a contract where it sees that none really exists. They have not really concluded their negotiations. There's too much disagreement. Now, as you might remember from this case, there was a lot of early procedure, and the trial court wanted to create a contract and actually supplied these terms. Courts can supply terms in certain instances, and they will try to get a contract where it seems like the parties intended. But the Supreme Court in this case ruled that because all of these terms were missing, that is not sufficient for them to be uh, the parties to have manifest an agreement to terms that the court can enforce. And the court will here not uh, create a contract where the parties did not themselves make one. And we see then that offers require these two features, the manifestation of intention to be bound and to be bound by what? By reasonably certain terms. Of course, we have three cases where we don't rise to that level of reasonably certain terms, so you may be mistaken in believing that that is hard to find. But actually, in most cases, we don't have this issue. Usually, the offer is definite when it contains price, parties, and subject matter. And we don't usually need much more than that, but these were sort of exceptional cases that prove the rule that we need to have reasonably certain terms. Another issue comes up is when a person makes a promise that is not really a promise, and so there's nothing to actually bind the party. This is getting back to that concept of the cancellation clause. An illusory promise are words in a promissory form that really promise nothing. And so if I say to you, I will sell you my car on Tuesday, unless I don't feel like it, have I actually made a promise? There's no promise made by that statement because I'm reserving the right to unilaterally revoke my agreement after you have agreed to it. And so I am not really promising to do anything. A promise or, a, or an apparent promise, I should say, is not consideration. If by its terms, the promisor or the purported promisor uh, reserves the choice of an alternative performance or no performance. And so that would create what's called an illusory promise. We also looked at the special issue of whether advertisements are offers. And this was mostly found in the famous, price, uh, famous case of Lefkowitz versus Great Minneapolis Supply Store. We learned the general rule that advertisements are usually not offers because advertisements usually do not manifest an intention to be bound by the offeror, in this case, the advertiser. They might have items for sale, but who's to say they'll have them in stock when you come calling? And sometimes they don't even include price at all. But in this particular case, there was this ad for 9 a.m. door jammers, sort of uh, if you think about Black Friday, right, the, the door busters that Target offers. And it actually specified the price of uh, $1. It specified the subject matter, which was a coat. And it specified the manner of acceptance, be one of the first three people to show up. And that also identified the parties. It didn't name a party, but the first three people who showed up ready to pay would therefore be the parties to this contract and could accept. This was a particular kind of contract, a contract that could only be accepted by performance. You had to actually show up in order to get the coat. But unlike most advertisements, this one was actually binding because it had the key terms of price, Subject matter, parties, manner of acceptance. And then it also included, sort of with the manner of acceptance, quantity, one per each person, right? 
up to three units. And so we could actually add to that list uh, quantity as a term that is often necessary for a contract if there is potentially more than one of the item. So again, typical terms that are required for certainty, which were found in this advertisement, raising it to the level of an offer, even though advertisements are usually not, price, subject, quantity, parties, and here, manner of acceptance helped put it over the top. We then had the case of Leonard v. PepsiCo, and you remember this advertisement. I'll let you watch it, and you decide for yourself whether or not this advertisement and the catalog that followed was an offer. Introducing the new Pepsi Stuff Catalog. Now, the more Pepsi you drink, the more great stuff you're going to get. Sure beats the bus. <laughs> And that was the key point of the offer here, the idea of getting a Harrier jet for points. You can see on the screen now we have a Harrier jet, 7 million points. Now, this was not in a catalog that was submitted for, uh, that was published by Pepsi, where there were items that you could get for points. And so we do have a, a sort of more basic question of whether a catalog is an offer. And we answer that question in the negative. Catalogs are not offers because they are simply invitations for offers. They do not contain quantity terms, and they don't actually contain a particular subject matter. They're not talking about every item in the catalog. And so a catalog usually is an invitation for offers that order form, when filled out and sent back, that's going to be more likely the offer coming from the customer. The other issue, though, in this case was whether or not this commercial was serious. And so it actually gets back to the idea of objective manifestation. What would a reasonable viewer think about this? And the court found that in this case, this was clearly not serious to sell a Harrier jet. You could buy Pepsi points for about 10 cents a point. That would put the value of this jet at $700,000. And for one thing, it's a military jet. They're not selling it to minors going to high school. And moreover, it's not going to be sold for $700,000. This was clearly an exaggerated commercial made in jest. And therefore, it would not be enforceable because it was not really an offer, uh, both because a catalog is not an offer, and this was not even in the catalog, and a reasonable observer looking at this situation would say Leonard would not be reasonable in thinking an offer to get a Harrier was made to him. He was a law student, and uh, I would call him uh, too clever by half in this case. These all are types, though, of uh, unilateral, not all, but the advertisement in this particular case uh, at Lefkowitz and we'll see with rewards are types of unilateral offers, a specific type of offer that has its own rules. A unilateral offer, quite simply, permits acceptance only by a performance, in fact, by complete performance. And you might think of it as a offer where a promise to perform will not do. You're not looking for a promise from the counterparty. You're looking only for full performance. And those commonly are going to be rewards and occasionally, as we see, some types of advertisements. Now, a reward example is simpler. I will pay $50 for the return of the diamond bracelet I lost yesterday on Main Street. Okay, well, what do I want? I want the bracelet. I don't want your promise to get me the bracelet. The first person who brings me that bra bracelet is going to receive the reward. Advertisements are usually not going to be rewards in this capacity, but as we saw, they can be offers under Lefkowitz. Carbolic smoke ball is our case for an advertisement that was also an advertisement for a reward, and it had the special case of a reward which would be enforceable. And the, the, uh, the advertisement said that if you use the carbolic smoke ball for a period of time and you contract influenza, which the carbolic smoke ball was meant to protect against, you would receive a reward for the company. And here, this was found to be valid. This was what we call a prove me wrong reward, and this is going to be something that is enforceable when someone completes the performance of the reward. We also spoke briefly, very briefly, about the competitive bidding process. And as just a, uh, a reminder, as we talk through that, the competitive bidding process often has many, many stages leading up to a final award. 
an acceptance. And in fact, the offer usually comes fairly late in that process. So the key takeaways here from competitive bidding are that requests for bids, requests for, for quotations, requests for information are almost always merely preliminary negotiations because they are an invitation to receive an offer. How much will it cost for you to repair my roof? The answer that I want is not yes, it's $8,000. And then I can say yes or no to that offer. 